All right. Okay, so uh, we had some mentions before in the last day and a half about a new file format that we are working on in Meta. Um, we call it, now we call it Nimble. Um, so today we're gonna talk about why we felt there is a need for a new file format. And in order to understand that, we are gonna have a short history lesson about columnar file formats. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about Nimble, what makes it different, how do we solve the problems that we saw. And so we'll dive a little bit into the internals and we'll talk a little bit about what's next for, for Nimble. Okay, so why do we need a new file format? Um, we have the existing file formats. Um, internally at Meta, we mostly use ORC. Um, seems like a lot of you guys are using Parquet. ORC and Parquet, they have very similar performance. Um, they solve the same problems, so they mostly behave the same. Um, in Meta, we noticed that our machine learning workloads, um, they spend roughly 30% of the time reading data before even processing the data. So what if we can make the reader roughly 2x faster? We can shrink this by 15%, which is our savings. And you can see a sneak peek here below. Um, you, on the left, you see a Nibble file, uh, which actually was, so it's, it's a real production file, uh, 1.3 gigabytes. On the right, you see the same data exactly written as ORC, produced 1.5 gigabytes. And you can see the rows per second uh, that we are getting from, um, from Nimble versus ORC. Um, now, there is an asterisk over there. Um, the numbers that you see here are for what we currently optimize, which is the machine learning workloads. These are very sequential reads. Uh, so don't go and expect to see this kind of performance improvement on every workload. I'm saying, I'm saying currently. So we are gonna spend a lot in, on analytics uh, in the near future. Uh, so we will see a lot of improvements on analytics sites as well. But do note that these numbers are specifically for machine learning. And by the way, uh, these files, um, so the reads that we're doing here, we are the projection of roughly 20% of the features in those files. And this is where Nimble really shines when we're doing projections. Um, yeah. Okay, so let's, <clears throat> let's do a quick history lesson about file formats. So on the left here, we have a table that we want to write into a file. On the right side, we're gonna have our file. Um, and this is a very simple table. Uh, the schema for this table, it's a struct or a row. Uh, it has two columns. Um, one is a big int column and the other one is a complex column, a map from big int to float. And this column is a features column. So the big int is the feature ID and the float is the feature value. Okay, so how can we go and represent this thing in a file? So, First thing we can try is row format. Um, we can take every row and put it one after the other in the file. Um, super easy to write, but if we look at the queries below, if we try to project one column from this file, um, user ID, it becomes really messy because now we need to try and find this user ID everywhere in the file. If the user ID, in this case it's a big int, but what if it's a string of variable length? very complex, not so nice. Uh, it gets even trickier if we now want to project feature uh, with key five out of this thing, but let's not focus on this just yet. So let's try to solve just the select user ID uh, from this table for now. So the next, so this is where we start looking into column in our file formats. Uh, so the next thing we can try is put the entire first column first and then we can put the second column after, um, it will solve the projection problem. But the problem with this thing is, how do you actually write this file? Because in order to write it like this, you need to have the entire data for column number one before you can start writing column number two. So now your file is limited to the machine memory because you need to hold the entire file in memory just to write it. So we don't do it like that. Uh, so what we do is we logically split the files into, uh, you in Parquet you hear the term row group, 
uh, in ORC, you hear the term stripes. Uh, so we stripe the file. And then inside every stripe, we write one column after the other. Now do note that these columns, now I have these green boxes here. Each column is actually broken down to multiple data streams in the file. And we'll talk about those streams later on. But the important thing is that we logically break the rows into row groups or stripes, and then we write one column after the other. Uh, when, we are, when we have enough data in memory, we flush a stripe, we erase this data from memory, and we start accumulating again. When we have enough data, we flush another stripe, and this is how we write things. So the next thing is how do we find all those stripes, row groups, and how do we find the streams inside those um, stripes? So this is where we have stripe footers. Um, and uh, in, in Parquet, these are called row groups metadata. Um, so in ORC, the stripe footers are right after the stripe. Um, and in, uh, in Parquet, they put them at the end all grouped together. Um, so two different approaches. And, and we'll see what the advantages and disadvantages of each. Uh, so what's inside these stripe footers? Um, so we have the location information of every stream. We also have the encoding information of every stream. Um, we're gonna talk about encodings, but do remember that currently we have the encoding information inside these footers. Uh, same thing for the row groups in Parquet. So we wrote the stripes, we wrote the stripe footers, and now it's time to finalize the file. We need to know where the stripe footers are. So we have a file footer. Uh, the file footer helps us find where the stripe footers are. Um, it also has schema information and other stuff, other metadata that we need to put into the file, index, statistics, whatever. Um, okay, so now if we want to read something from this file, so let's say we want to read the features column from this file, we need to do one I.O. Uh, to read the file footer, we need another I.O. To, to read the stripe footer, and then we need one or more I.O.s to read the actual streams that belong to this column. Uh, what's the problem with IOs? So uh, if, you, if you are using, if, if you don't want to pay for expensive in-memory storage or SSD-based storage, if you want to lower your storage costs, eventually there will be a physical hard drive somewhere. Um, and the cost of an IO, the head of the hard drive needs to seek to the right location. On average, this is 12 milliseconds. So every IO, you pay 12 milliseconds that you will never get back. So we don't want IOs. We want as minimum IOs as we can. Um, so we try to be smart with our internal ORC implementation. Um, and we've, uh, in order to understand how we, how we try to be smart, let's understand how we actually read the file. So we start reading the file by reading the file footer. Now we don't know the size of the file footer ahead of time. The size is written right at the end of the file. So in theory, we can do a one tiny I.O. to get the size of the file footer and another I.O. to get the actual footer. But what we are doing is we are actually issuing a one megabyte I.O. at the end of the file, and hopefully the entire file footer will be there. Um, in the worst case, we'll need another I.O. to read the rest of the file footer. But in all cases, in ORC, uh, since most of the metadata is in the stripe footers, the, the actual file footer is pretty small. So we invoke this one megabyte of read, and we usually overshoot the file footer by a lot. Um, so we try to be smart, and we said, okay, let's copy the stripe footers right next to the file footer, so when we invoke this one megabyte IO, we'll get few stripe footers for free, um, and we are saving some IOs. That was great for a while, but then our machine learning table starting, started to become bigger and bigger. We had more and more features, um, and with more and more features, um, it means more and more streams in the file. It means that the metadata became bigger and bigger and bigger, and eventually this cache didn't hold a lot of stripe footers. So this wasn't that great after a while. 
Now, let's actually talk about those data streams now that we have over there. So if we look at the map um, from a begin to a float, um, we break it down into multiple streams. Uh, so in the case of a map uh, of simple types, begin and float, we have a data stream representing whether each map is null or not. We have a data stream representing the size of each map, and then we have all the keys for the maps and all the values for the map. Um, now the problem, now let's go back to the second query that we had before, select feature number five from this thing. Uh, this is not very doable with this representation uh, because in order to get feature number five, we need to materialize the entire map into memory and then filter, throw away everything else. And if we talk about 10,000 features, that's a lot of waste. So we, we don't actually store our maps, our features like that. Um, you heard the term in some other presentations, flat maps, but think about it like this. We, we flatten this, this map. So we promote every key. Uh, it, you think about it like we are storing it as a struct inside. Um, and every key is its own column. Uh, so now for, for us to do a projection of a specific key, it's just like doing a projection of a column. You go into the metadata, you find exactly the streams that you need. You read only those streams. Uh, so it's way more efficient to do that. But do note the stripe footer below. Now the stripe footer becomes giant because of that. Because now when we have 10,000 features, they roughly translate to three to five streams. We have 50,000 streams um, and we need a lot of space for the stripe footers. Another problem that we have with the stripe footers and the row groups in Parquet is how they are, they are being laid out. So in ORC, um, they use protobuf uh, plus compression on top. Uh, in Parquet, they use the Thrift uh, Compact Protocol. Uh, these two protocols are all on nothing protocols. So in order to read a single value from this thing, you need to decode the entire thing. Uh, in the case of ORC, you need to decompress the entire thing and then decode the entire thing and just to get a single entry out of this thing. So think about machine learning workloads which project roughly five to 10% out of the features. We still need to decompress and decode the entire stripe footer um, just to get this thing. Parquet has actually a, a bigger problem than, uh, than ORC because Parquet is putting everything as row groups metadata at the end and they encode all the row groups together as one giant thrift compact protocol. So if they want to read one stripe, uh, they still need to decode the entire thing. Um, they need to decode all the stripes. So RC benefits that they only need to decode the, the one stripe footer. Um, so that's the problem that we had with those footers. Now, inside those data streams, we have data. Um, and each data stream is very, very nice data shape. So the nulls are, you can, are bitmaps or Boolean values. The data, if it's a primitive integer type, these are integers. How do we write them down into the file? Um, this is where encodings and compression comes into play. Um, in ORC, we have a small set of encodings that we can use to encode data. Uh, Parquet has a little bit longer list of encodings to choose from. Um, and so we try to find good encoding for the data. Um, and, and you can see the list here. Uh, so just to uh, touch about the difference between encoding and compression and why do we need both. Um, so encoding, uh, you can think about it as the in-memory presentation of the data. So when we read it from the file, we don't want to completely flatten the data in memory. It's very wasteful. So we prefer to have the data encoded in memory. But we need the data to be seekable or easily decodable. With compression, it's, it's like the serialization protocol we saw before. It's all or nothing. We need to decompress the entire thing before we can read a single value out of it. So encodings is our way to store data in memory 
in a compacted way where, where we can still materialize chunks of the data without waste, spending the cost of materializing the entire thing. Compression is something we sometimes apply on top in order to get more storage savings. Uh, when it's time to read, we pay the decompression cost. Um, so that's the difference between encodings and compression. So now let's talk about Nimble and what we are doing different. Um, and and the, idea, the main idea behind Nimble is try to learn from past mistakes. Try to identify the bottlenecks, try to find solutions, um, and we do have some other nice ideas, uh, but it's mostly about learning from past mistakes and uh, just be very diligent and pay attention to details. Uh, so the design principles that we had with, uh, with Nimble is, first of all, try to make it simple. Um, don't try to make it too complex. Uh, one of the main principles that we have over there is if you don't need something, don't read it. Or if you have to read it, you don't have to pay for decoding it uh, if you don't really need this data. Um, we also understand that not all data is made equal. So the small set of encodings that we saw before is not sufficient. We need something better. Um, we understand that no, not all use cases are the same. So machine learning use case is very different from analytics. Uh, and sometimes even in the machine learning, uh, sometimes you want to optimize for storage size. Sometimes you, you want to optimize for read size. Um, so not all use cases are the same. Uh, and one of the most important thing that we try to do with Nimble is uh, to make it extensible. Uh, we had all these great ideas that we wanted to add to file formats, but we couldn't add them to RC um, without completely breaking the file format. So we tried to build Nimble as simple blocks um, that it should be easy to extend without breaking the file format too much. So let's talk about Nimble internals. So the file layout itself. Um, you look on the right side, it looks very similar to what we saw before. Uh, we have stripes, we have streams, but we don't have stripe footers or row group metadata anymore. How did we end up with that? So if you remember what I told you about stripe footers, they have encoding information, they have the location information. So one thing we did, we said, okay, let's take the encoding information and put it inside the streams. Uh, so then we ended up with just the location information, which is not very big. If you think about it, it's just offset and size. Uh, so we took all this encoding information, all this location information, and we moved it uh, down to the file footer. Uh, and we took all the encoding information and we put it inside the stream. Uh, by putting the encoding information um, inside the stream, we are getting two benefits. One is if we don't read those streams, we don't even pay the overhead of understanding the, the, the encoding information. Um, and the second thing, it allows us to do way more complex encodings. In ORC and in par and Parquet, the encodings are enums. It's a dictionary. Uh, but you can't say more than that on the dictionary. So I, I don't know if you, under, if you know how dictionary encoding works. Dictionary is very useful when you have data with um, a lot of repeating values. Um, so you basically create an alphabet with the repeating values, and then you store the indices that point into this thing, and hopefully the indices are very small so you can encode them very nicely, and eventually you eliminate all the repetitions by, by, by doing that. So in, both in ORC and, and Parquet, they have a dictionary, but because they just represent it with an enum saying this is a dictionary, so they have to use the same encoding for the indices. They can't choose different encodings for indices. So uh, in ORC, for example, they use run length encoding for the indices. Run length encoding is if you have the same value repeating a lot of times and then another value repeating a lot of times, you basically store the value, how many times it appears. The next value, how many times it appears. But if you have a dictionary that's, let's say, it's a string uh, it has four strings in it. 
uh, A, B, and C, and then A, B, and C, A, B, and C. Runlet encoding for the indices is the worst thing possible. Um, but RC doesn't have an alternative. So either it chooses a dictionary or completely something else because it is what it is. So with putting the metadata inside a stream, we are actually, we can do better. We can create something we call nested encodings. We can go and say we want a dictionary, and then we can choose how we want to encode the alphabet and how we, can, how we encode the indices. Uh, so we can create really complex things inside. Another thing we did is we treat nulls as just another encoding. Uh, so instead of having a separate streams for nulls, we encode it as part of the data. And if the data is not nullable, we actually don't need to encode anything. So we just, we don't even pay the cost for encoding it. So this gives us the, the ability to have less streams in the file, which means less metadata, which means that this thing that we put in the file footer with the locations is uh, much smaller. And again, as I mentioned, it's optional. If the data is not nullable, it's not there. Um, Okay, and the last thing that we did here with, the, with our metadata, so with the metadata that we actually have, we are using uh, a serialization protocol called flat buffers by Google. Um, and flat buffers, the name say, says it all. It's a flat buffer. And this protocol, in order to access data inside this protocol, you don't need to decode the entire thing. You have direct access um, it's basically offsets into the data inside this thing. It does mean that the data is not compressed or encoded in any way. So we do have optional compression on top if this thing becomes very big. But I can tell you uh, that so far, we have uh, uh, the compression kicks in in our configuration after one megabyte never kicked in. Uh, the worst case I've seen this thing is getting to 600 kilobytes or something like that uh, in some really crazy tables. Um, Okay, so let's talk about those encodings and what we're doing inside um, Nimble. Uh, so I mentioned the concept of nested encodings. And basically, if you think about the dictionary example, um, when we choose a dictionary, we have this header saying this is a dictionary, and then we have something saying where the alphabet starts and where the indices start, and then you go over there and you find another header describing how the alphabet is encoded, and it can be a further nested thing, and you can create a tree of encodings, and you can tailor it for the data. Um, so out of the box right now, we have all this list of nested encodings, and we have the actual leaf encodings that eventually encode data and don't break it further down. Uh, but we do have way more planned, and we are working closely with academia. Um, they have great ideas for, for encodings. And the nice thing about the fact that the metadata is part of the stream, it's super easy to add new encodings uh, to, to the file. You don't need to change anything about the file layout. It's just introducing new encodings. Uh, and we do have a versioning story in the file so that if an old reader tries to read something, it will know that something might be crazy here. But you don't need to change the file format for that. Um, and same thing, we have uh, the ability to do optional compression um, on the leaf level um, of those encodings. Um, and it, so if we need extra storage savings and we're willing to sacrifice a little bit of read speed, uh, we, use, uh, we use compression. By the way, the, the benchmark that you saw at the beginning was actually pretty aggressive on compression in this example. Okay, so we have these nested encodings. We can build these giant encoding trees with this great flexibility. There is great complexity. How, how do you choose the optimal encoding tree? And, and I guess the, the other question is, what is actually the optimal encoding tree? Because as I mentioned, not all use cases are the same. Uh, sometimes you optimize for read speed, sometimes you optimize for write speed. Uh, you need to take into account read to write ratio. Um, sometimes you optimize for file size. Um, for analytics workloads, you might want to have all the data easily seekable. Um, so you need to take this in, into account. So our solution for that is we have 
pluggable encoding selection policies um, into the alpha into the nimble rider um, and we started in small steps the first thing that we've implemented was a brute forcing solution at the time of write um, we tried different trees combinations we limited the depth to two uh, and we tried those and we actually tried to read them during the write to see how read performance behaves how the size and then we applied the cost function uh, this was super slow to write, but it produced nice, nice results, even with uh, trees that are just two level deep. Um, the next thing we did was uh, calculating statistics on the data and then applying some heuristics in order to pick the best encodings. Um, best in quotes because these are still heuristics. Uh, this was 10x faster than the brute force solution and produced good, very good results. Um, but still, still not fast enough. Calculating the statistics wasn't, wasn't that great. Uh, the next thing we've implemented is something we called encoding DB. So we identified that um, our tables, um, the, data, uh, the data shape is, stays the same for at least, at least two weeks, if not even more. So what we are doing, we have an offline process that loads data from, from these tables and then doing a much more offline brute forcing with heuristics and whatever we want and we are actually we keep iterating on making this thing better uh, and we capture the encodings that we find and when it's time to write we load this captured state and we apply it uh, this made writing again 2x faster than before uh, and it actually even produces smaller file sizes now uh, which is uh, which is nice and we have Way, way more iterations to do on this encoding DB thing. Uh, in some cases, we are using hard-coded selection. So, for example, if we have cases where we know that we are writing once, reading maybe twice, and we don't hold this data for a very long time, we just apply trivial encoding with compression on top. We don't need to do any fancy selection. And so we, with this encoding selection policies, we can really tailor how the file will behave for the use case. Um, and another thing we are experimenting with is machine learning based selection, um, trying to see if we can do some hybrid thing, uh, if we do need all the statistics or not, or if we can be better at this. And by the way, in order to do all this thing, uh, Nimble is writing the data differently than ORC. Um, so ORC, as soon as we see data, as soon as we ingest data, we start encoding it and compressing it, and we accumulate the encoded compressed data in memory. Nimble is doing it differently. Nimble is accumulating raw data in memory, um, and when, it's, when we hit a raw data threshold, this is where we try to encode, compress, um, and, and write it. Um, the advantages of doing that is we have a better um, we have more view of the data when it's time to encode uh, and compress, so we can do better flush decisions. The other thing is it protects the reader. Um, so in ORC, we sometimes see that the data is super compressible. So uh, we end up, we write the data, we start compressing it, compressing it, compressing it. Um, ORC, when, when the compressed data hits a threshold, this is when we write it to storage. Now, on the reader side, we read this thing, because it was super compressible, it expands to something giant in memory, and then you see readers uh, ooming. So by the fact that we now work out of the raw data and not out of the compressed data, we have better control on what the reader will see, because the worst that the reader will see is the raw data. Um, yep. there, there is a slight disadvantage for this thing. We do need sometimes more memory when we write because we accumulate raw data. But there are um, solutions in the file we can chunk uh, this thing and not flush to disk. Um, I will not get into it. We do have solutions for that as well. Okay, so what's next for Nimble? Um, so the first big announcement is that we're going to open source this thing very soon, um, talking about in the upcoming weeks. Uh, so you can start playing with it. 
But do note, uh, currently what we have is optimized for our machine learning workloads. So analytics, still no support for that. Uh, this is the next thing we're going to work on, um, supporting analytics. So uh, selective readers and uh, predicate push down, still not there. Uh, so if you want to play with this thing and just don't try to run it on analytics workloads, you will be disappointed and you will say, what are you doing? Um, we have plans on um, returning more efficient uh, VLOX vectors um, in places. So today we are returning flat vectors, but um, except for one case where we return dictionary vectors, but we have way more opportunities to keep our encodings more and expose them uh, in fancier VLOX vectors like dictionary vectors. Um, so the memory, in, the in-memory presentation will be even better. Uh, we have plans to add, as I mentioned, way more encodings um, to the file. And we also plan on improving the existing encodings that we have with CMD, uh, or I mentioned GPU stuff. Um, so there's that. Um, we have new ideas uh, that we want to implement inside the file. Um, so one example, there are many examples, but one interesting example is something we call shared dictionaries. Um, so remember the dictionary thing, it has an alphabet, it has indices. Now think about a stream across stripes. It's the same data shape. Uh, so if you pick dictionary encoding for the first stripe, it, it makes sense that we'll pick dictionary encoding for the second stripe. And it makes sense that the alphabet will be very similar uh, between these two stripes. So why store the alphabet twice? Um, it's actually true also, we, we learned that it's true also horizontally. So if you have different features, some of them look very similar. So why store the alphabet more than once? Uh, so this thing we call it shared dictionaries and the plan is to do sharing of the alphabet horizontally and vertically. Uh, which we also believe is going to help a lot with uh, CPU cache locality. Um, so we'll see. We'll see how it works. Uh, we already started working on parallel encoding and parallel decoding. Um, everything over there is self-contained, so it's super easy to do it in parallel, which speeds up the write. Uh, not so speed up the read so far with our test, but um, we'll see. We'll see how we can make it better. We have way more ideas. So this thing with the flat maps, we, we have uh, the, the flat maps, if you remember this thing, how we take a map and convert it to structs. We have ideas for hybrid flat maps, uh, which is partially maps, partially structs. We have tons of ideas. Every week we come up with new ideas. Uh, the pipeline is super long. So expect to see many more things to come. From our learnings, it will be just free in the reader and writer. That's it. That's Nimble. So um, are strings part of each stripes you mentioned? Yes. Okay. So on the, the last topic that you presented about what's next, in terms of shared dictionaries, you talked about sharing across each stripes. What if you don't pick both the stripes where you cannot really uh, exploit the sharing possibility, right? So what if no, we so, so we, we are not, so when we do share dictionaries, they will not be stored as part of the stripe. So uh, Nimble has uh, this concept of optional sections. This is where we store, we store the, uh, the index for the file, the statistics. There will be an optional section for the shared alphabets. Uh, so a file with shared dictionaries, you will have to read the alphabets that you want and then you read the streams with, which will just have the indices. Uh, so if you happen to read two stripes, you read the alphabet once, but if you just need to read one stripe from this file, you still need to read the alphabet separately and the indices separately. Thank you. I, I have a question, which is probably an IO optimization question. Perhaps it's more pertinent for the next, but I'll ask you anyway. Um, at the end of the day, when you're uh, when you're laying out the uh, the file format, you want to read the data as the the relevant data that you need as fast as possible. And uh, when you're looking at files, you're probably looking at a you know distributed file system or an object store, uh, something like that. But typically, at least, and you have to 
pardon me for this, my experience with actual measurement of this is, is a little dated, but when I, when I was experimenting with Ceph, for example, you would get about a third of the read bandwidth that the raw hardware could actually provide. Uh, you, there, there are optimizations you can do where if you're aware of what the hardware looks like, then you can, you can say, for example, put your, heart, uh, your hotter data on the outer diameters of, uh, of, of, of HDD, or perhaps this is random access, I got a mix of S, SSGs and HDDs, this goes on SSGs, this goes on HDD, so you can, get, you can cost optimize. Um, it, it, have you considered any such uh, IO optimization, or am I just better off waiting for the next, uh, uh, next talk? So yes, so at Meta we are considering everything that you mentioned. Uh, it's not part of the file format itself. So the file format is using uh, a, a file API eventually and we can use local files, we can use our blob storage solution that we have at, at Meta. It's their responsibility to think about where to store it on the platter on the disk. Um, what we can do when we implement this file API, we can do parallel uh, reads from, from that thing, but it's, it's a very clear separation between, between what we are trying to do and what is the responsibility of the actual hardware that we do. But we do, when we optimize this thing, we optimize only this thing on the hardware that we run. So it's the reader side of things, we profile it and, and optimize it. between two columns and then you coalesce the I.O. So you do a single I.O. and then you throw away some bytes. Uh, so this is a common thing that you can uh, do with big gaps if you have uh, like uh, block storage and if you have SSD, then you can do that over smaller gaps. And this is, it kind of brings this uh, machine learning experience. You have some of these uh, columns that occur a lot and are frequently read and you have others that are less frequently read so you want to clump all the frequently read columns next to each other so that uh, you can share an io across multiple columns that's a typical thing that that happens in these applications yeah that's a good point so this is an optimization for example that we did on the reader on the writer side of things where uh, like ori mentioned if you know that some features are very hot uh, when we discover this offline after people are using them, when it's time to write, we make sure that we write all of them together so that we need to issue less IOs um, in the storage. But there is a very clear separation of what optimizations we do on our layer and what optimizations others are. Um, we looked at file formats and also table formats very closely. Um, so how do you envisage Nimble in terms of table formats, partition, sortedness indices on top of tables and you know iceberg delta and you know so on and so forth are already it's invested. a good question so yeah. uh nimble is solving the file format thing it's not solving the table format thing uh we do have efforts to figure out the table format thing and how we can share stuff between files so for example maybe not storing the schema um, in every file and extracting it outside even though with flat maps and the fact that every flat map can have different keys, it's a bit problematic. Uh, so we do have those thinking, but they are not part of Nimble. It's a top level. Nimble solves the file format there. And also the stats problem is chronic with tables and you have lots of stats, like count distinct, you know, it's not That's, So as I mentioned right now, yeah. Nimble doesn't have stats in it yet for analytics. Okay. And this is one question that we're trying to answer. How big are the stats that we're going to store in the file versus the stats that we're going to store outside of the file? And we're still trying to put the needle in the right place. Your great talk and um, very well articulated. So thank you for that. Um, he already covered the analytics question. Had um, It's non-intuitive, at least for me, when you do these encodings and you talked about aggressive compression, how does that work? Doesn't that come in the way of how much you can compress? And the two in conflict with so each other? So for us, putting it in a columnar format, it actually compresses better because when you end up compressing, you are compressing the same data shape. Mm -hmm. uh, and compressors and encodings and compressors work better on a specific data shape. Whereas if you do it on a row level thing, you have mixed really? yeah, weird stuff which doesn't compress very well. Um, even, even in our case, one of the leaf encodings is variant. Uh, we most of the time don't apply compression on variant. It doesn't make sense. Uh, so 
for us, columnar thing compresses better and is encoded better. By the way, we do have higher level things. Uh, so when we understand the way that people write stuff, uh, we can do something before we even get to encoding. So one example that we're doing, uh, if you think about our data warehouse, I don't know if other people have the same problem, we de denormalize the data because we don't want to do 